Hello and welcome to another episode of the Weekly Defence Podcast, the show about defence procurement and military technology. I am your host, Richard Thomas, and this week I go in-depth with Defence Insight Senior Land Analyst on the influences and factors impacting, impacting the global armoured vehicle market. And military training and simulation editor Trevor Nash speaks with CAE's new president, Daniel Gelston, on the latest developments in the sector and how the company has adapted to the COVID pandemic. But before we jump into all that, let's look at some of the headlines over the past week. And we start in Iran, which last week unveiled a large multi-purpose combat vessel. State-run media described the Shahid Rudaki as an ocean-going aircraft carrier capable of hosting fighters and helicopters, although imagery suggests this is an exaggerated description of a repurposed roll-on, roll-off merchant vessel. The vessel's foredeck appears to have four two-cell anti-ship missile launch canisters installed, while the mid-deck featured a helipad and a number of small UAVs. Four fast boats and two truck-mounted surface-to-air missile launches were visible further aft. Analysis from Dried Global concluded the vessel was a poor strategic fit for the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps Navy, describing it as a vanity project. In the air domain, Airbus and the German government have submitted a formal offer to provide Eurofighter Typhoon for the Swiss Air 2030 fighter modernisation programme. Under Air 2030, Switzerland intends to buy up to 40 aircraft to replace its fleet of F-A-18 Hornets and F-5 EF Tigers. A national referendum held on 27th of September this year resulted in a slim majority in favour of proceeding with the procurement. Other contenders besides Eurofighter Typhoon include the Boeing F-A-18 EF Super Hornet, the Dassault Rafale, and of course the F-35A from Lockheed Martin. In Norway, the MOD has identified the South Korean K-2 Black Panther and the German Leopard A-2 2A-7 as potential solutions to improve the Army's main battle tank fleet. The number of tanks, cost framework and project timescale are still to be defined, but a Norwegian MOD spokesperson said that the new MBTs will replace Leopard 2 A4 tanks that are more than 30 years old. These MBTs have shortcomings when it came to fulfilling today's operational requirements, the spokesperson told Shepard, emphasising that the main goal of purchasing new tanks is to increase the operational capability of the army. The MOD now expects to send a procurement proposal to the Norwegian Parliament for approval in 2021. And finally, in the UK, additional details are slowly being released into the public domain of a new class of warship, dubbed the Type 32, being developed for the Royal Navy. The unexpected announcement of Type 32 during last week's defence spending boost caught most naval analysts and watchers off guard, as the Royal Navy already has plans to replace its 13 Type 23 frigates with 8 Type 26 and 5 Type 31 frigates. However, Shepard understands that the Type 32 will likely have a focus on mine countermeasure capabilities, acting as motherships for unmanned systems currently under development. Current MOD planning sees the project getting underway in the second half of the decade. And that was some of the news in brief that have hit the desks over the past few days. Moving on, and it's that time in the show when we drag in the news team for their take as to what's caught their eye over the past week. So that means welcoming Air Editor Tim Martin and Land Reporter Flavia Camargas Pereira. Hello, both. Hello. Hi, Rich. And I think I can speak for everyone in saying that the really big news uh, came obviously at the end of last week with the announced boost to UK defence spending and the, in my view, entirely correct focus on the maritime domain. Flavia, what's your take on it from the land desk, though? Actually, we were surprised because uh, they just, uh, Boris Johnson just didn't speak about the the major British Army armoured vehicle programmes. And uh, it was kind of a surprise for us. What, 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 what sort of what sort of take do you have it from 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 the land desk? I mean, you obviously said that major programs were sort of not mentioned, not 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 even touched on. So, are, are there any sort of any sort of capabilities or, or sort of messages you can you can draw from that as to what what will stick or what might potentially go? Yep, yeah, uh, Boris Johnson omitted any reference to the Ajax, Boxer, Challenger Two, and Warrior. But in terms of land capabilities, he emphasized that the army will be reshaped uh, to the age of um, network warfare. And uh, basically, this, this reshaping will focus on emerging technologies. And the goals are to, to have better equipped the soldiers and uh, to strengthen the, the ability of the spec- special forces to operate covertly against uh, the most sophisticated adversaries. Yeah, I think he mentioned um, a couple of lines about soldiers being able to 
um, effectively be more operationally aware as to what was going on in their sort of immediate and further distant surroundings. So I suppose that's a, a little bit of progress. Where do you think the resources uh, for the land might uh, rest then? Yeah, actually, uh, we talk it to to some um, spoke people from the MOG and they couldn't estimate um, how investments in this in this uh, defense spending will be allocated to a particular land program. Um, as the, the decisions on capabilities are still being worked through the integrated review, uh, I, actually only in the next year it will be possible to to detail these spendings for uh, specific programs. Actually, I think it's interesting to highlight, Richard, that um, in his announcement, Boris Johnson spoke about funding for specific naval programs and air projects. Uh, As you said, the new Type 32 and uh, the future combat air system. But uh, the lack of attention to armored vehicle programs may indicate that uh, the integrated review will recommend cuts in these programs. Yeah, it's my understanding that um, the government really sees naval and air power as uh, obviously important capabilities that they need to wield, but also politically safer options to wield in case of times of conflict or even or even war that obviously the UK does not want to get involved in another protracted land campaign and as you say that means potentially cuts to armored vehicles and maybe even troop troop um, uh, sizes yeah and if I if I could just jump in as well and obviously uh, land is not my speciality but I did read there were reports that the army had been asked to resubmit their plans for the integrated review so potentially I suppose you could say that uh, the, the first submission that they made, my, the MOD may have come back with some revisions to say we're not too happy with X or Y and, you know, we're going to need you to to have a rethink there. Um, so kind of unusual in that sense, but also it might speak to the idea that the MOD aren't saying um, too much on this uh, prior to the the uh, the integrated review being, uh, as we're led to believe by Boris Johnson, uh, finishing up in early 2021. Yeah, that, that's, that's a fair point. I don't think um, the uh, Royal Navy and RAF uh, have had to sort of resubmit or, 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 or have to go away and do their homework again before handing it back into the to, to the to the teacher. Unlike the land side, which is which is yeah interesting. So, Flavia, in 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 terms of cuts, what are the most threatened programs, or what might be the most threatened programs? Is probably a better way of phrasing it. Yeah, actually, I, I just want to, to make a point on what Tim said because. Uh, in, even if the the army is not, if there isn't plans to to use the army uh, or to take part in some uh, land uh, mission or some land battlefield, actually the army needs to be ready for every possible scenario. And uh, at this point, I just think it's kind of hard because the army has some kind of aging platforms and the. Uh, Regarding regarding cuts, I think uh, the Ajax and Boxer programs, uh, they are contractually committed. So uh, actually, in my point of view, Challenger 2 and Warrior would be the most threatened uh, programs. Uh, Boxers, at this point, it seems to be progressing, including during the last week, a new contract was announced, a new production contract. Uh, KML concluded this deal, this deal with um, WFEL for the production of, of uh, who's over 10 years. And uh, it also included um, a, a deal for um, a deal for assembling integration and test of approximately uh, 250 platforms. And in the case of the Ajax, uh, the first batch of the first batch of vehicles were handed over in July. The program had some some delays, but uh, it seems to be on track by now. 
and uh, the remaining pra platforms, the remaining Ajax platforms, uh, will be delivered by to 2025. So I think at this point, um, Challenger and Warrior would be the the most threatened programs because uh, they are not contractually committed at this point. I would uh, probably agree with you. Um, so, Tim, on the air side, how did the air fare? I think uh, news was fairly uh, thin on the air side, Rich, uh, to put fairly bluntly. Um, beyond further investment in Tempest, uh, there wasn't a whole lot to, to get uh, excited about. Uh, although there was a mention of, uh, in terms of a new space command uh, being set up, uh, and uh, there was a reference made to uh, UK's first rockets being launched from Scotland, to paraphrase Boris Johnson, uh, from uh, 2022. Um, so yeah, the, the, those were the kind of uh, the main themes. Um, but I suppose the, the bigger question for the integrated review, and hopefully it will resolve, will be um, the balance, striking a balance for combat air, um, not only the F-35, but um, how much exactly is going to be funded um, uh, for Tempest. And then beyond that, of course, there's Eurofighter as well to be uh, considered. So I think, um, you know, come the end of January, I think certainly that will be something that I'll be um, digging into and, and certainly looking to, to learn a bit more about. Um, but also, uh, outside of what uh, Boris Johnson was saying specifically, uh, I did reach out to the MOD to talk to them about the possibility of the RAF's uh, Puma um, being uh, replaced, because that has been touted or at least been thought about uh, for for some time uh, without a program of, of record um, you know being laid out by the MOD um, so they did say that it is under consideration uh, the replacement so um, you know there's a there's a possibility then beyond that that uh, the integrated review uh, you know puts out uh, you know ex or lays a bit more on top of that uh, in terms of detail uh, so that'd be quite interesting. Um, to learn a little bit more about and Puma being kind of the the medium lift uh, capability for uh, the R or sorry for the <clears throat> yeah for the the RAF uh, and of course it's been you know to places like uh, Northern Ireland uh, during the Troubles and then uh, in uh, in Iraq as well so uh, you know it's it's much needed it's kind of a in in terms of uh, you know medium lift it's obviously essential uh, and. The Puma it goes out of out of date in 2025, um, so you know it is fairly urgent uh, that the MOD get on with this in terms of um, mentioning to uh, industry what's expected and um, putting forward a, an acquisition plan. I mean, Puma I think is probably the last major rotary um, capability that needs to be renewed, isn't it? I think everything else has either got brand new kit or kit that's halfway through through its service life. So would that any any Puma replacement would that would that complete um, the RAF's and of course the British Army's procurement of new rotary? Yeah, pretty much. But I think the the, the bigger question is um, what are the options on the table um, that might be considered by the RAF? So you have Leonardo with the AW at one four nine, um, and which we've spoken about previously has uh, got an order uh, from uh, Egypt for 24 units uh, and there's al also been uh, delivery previously to the Royal Thai Army for a fleet of five. Um, so that would be kind of one contender that perhaps you could say is leading the race because the, the time frame is interesting because in 2025 um, uh, items like uh, U.S. Army's future vertical lift, uh, medium range uh, aircraft wouldn't be ready. Um, of course, the UK has said that it is uh, interested in, you know, observing how FEL uh, continues. Uh, and of course, you know, there's been a a, a strong track record of uh, buying um, rotary aircraft from the U.S. You think of the likes of um, the Apache, for example. Um, so. That window looks like it wouldn't work um, because the the first operational unit, our first unit equipped milestone for the US is, uh, I think, from 2028 to 2030, some, somewhere in around there. So you're, yeah, that window uh, in terms of when you would replace, obviously that would leave a, a capability gap. So that looks to be a, that doesn't look to be a runner. Um, so 
Yeah, and Leonardo, I, I got in touch with them just to kind of uh, dig into what their perspective uh, on this would be. Uh, and they kind of said that uh, that uh, they understand the MOD has considered a number of equipment options, including a possible requirement for a medium aircraft to replace um, Puma. For the moment, however, there remains no formal program of record and as a consequence, no schedule for replacement. Uh, but in anticipation of a formal uh, requirement being communicated to industry, we're standing by with the, the 149 uh, and, um, and we'll, you know, they'll, they'll, in the, uh, Leonardo will then take things from there. Um, so yeah, that, that's quite interesting. And I suppose coincidentally, there was uh, a letter of uh, a letter of uh, intent signed by five NATO allies, including the UK, uh, Greece, and Italy, on a next generation rotorcraft capability, which uh, is to is uh, to specifically design uh, a new uh, medium uh, class uh, rotorcraft or helicopter. So, um, you know, again, that would be quite interesting, but it, that's certainly not of interest. For the Puma replacement, just should say because again the the timeline for development is uh, well first deliveries would be from 2035 uh, onwards. So uh, as medium lift developments go, uh, fairly interest and stuff there. Yep. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Flavia, for for your contributions. Um, for our listeners, if you'd like to find out more about all the stories that have been discussed in this episode, and please visit our website at shepherdmedia.com forward slash news. And coming up next, we are in conversation with Defence Insight Sonny Butterworth for more on the armoured vehicle market. Stay tuned. And if you roll right the way back to that sort of 1950s, 1960s, early 70s, the UK was really at the cutting edge of space and space launch and every aspect. And now we're getting back there again. How do you weigh lunar sample in a weightless environment? How do you test for water on the tip of a drill bit on the moon when you're back on Earth? Our ability to be part of that program is absolutely fascinating. The UK space sector has seen rapid development in recent decades with a total income of about £15 billion and generating more than 40,000 jobs. The industry and its government partners have identified significant room for growth in the coming years, fuelled by domestic investment and international programmes. However, the sector faces a number of challenges. How can it recruit the people it needs when there's a widespread shortfall of STEM-focused employees? How can it support education across the board, from primary level to university students? And what will be the impact of leaving the European Union? Welcome to episode two of the Defining the Future podcast, Shepherd Studios series on aerospace and defence innovation, sponsored by our partner Raytheon UK, a company invested in Britain, creating British jobs and supporting local communities around the UK. To learn more about the transformation underway across the UK space sector, listen to the Defining the Future podcast, available now wherever you get your podcasts. The Middle East and North Africa region's armoured vehicle requirements have for decades been met by international suppliers keen to sell their wares into its rich market, not just for defence purposes, but also as a geopolitical tool. This has resulted in a patchwork of armoured capabilities. As far as main battle tanks go in the GCC alone, the UAE operates the French Leclerc, Oman the British Challenger 2, and the Qatari Land Forces, equipped with the French AMX-30, German Leopard 2, and soon Turkey's Altai. The other half of the GCC is provided for by the US, with wealthy Kuwait still seeing use of its US-made M1A2 Abrams, Bahrain soldiering on with the ageing M60A3, and the Royal Saudi Army, both the Abrams and M60. North African countries show a similar pattern, with added uh, influences from Russia, and this is just the main battle tanks. If anything, the IFE and AFE sector looks even more complex. However, with indigenous manufacturing on the up, is the state of affairs set to change? Well, hopefully providing some answers, I am delighted to welcome back to the show Defence Insights Senior Land Analyst, Sonny Butterworth. Sonny, thanks for joining us. Good morning, Richard. Thanks for having me on. Not at all. Thank you very much. So, MENA has been a, a 
a traditionally a, a, a very large uh, importer of armoured vehicles. What's the sort of mid and long term prospects for uh, the region in terms of uh, sales? Well, I think the question we're all wondering is, um, will at school continue to be a major market in the next 10 years? And in some ways, that's difficult to say, because as we know with the Middle East, many countries, they don't really publish their defence budgets. They don't give much of an indication on their ongoing programmes and what their requirements are, unless you're well connected with an industry. So we kind of have to infer what we think the requirements might be in the next 10 years and anticipate anticipate them in that way. And that can be looking at um, sometimes reports in defence media or, or local media that might give an indication as to uh, what a particular country wants. Or it could be looking at the platforms they already have. So you mentioned some of those earlier. Um, you might say, look at a country like Bahrain, say those, those M60s, those are perhaps getting a bit long in the tooth now. Maybe they're due for a replacement uh, over the next 10 years, or maybe they just need to be upgraded to still remain capable. So yeah, based on, on the programs that we can firmly identify, um, we think there's over $50 billion worth of new procurement. That's you know, new build platforms over the next 10 years. But also looking at some of our data on um, the platforms already in service and when they may need to be refreshed or even replaced, you know, there's potentially uh, tens of thousands of vehicles that uh, need need something happening to them or, or some money spent on them. So I think there is still um, the potential for it to be a very big market. And I think as well, if you look at the in, the kind of um, ingredients of traditionally driven spending in the Middle East, well, it's um, still really racked by many wars. You know, we have uh, the civil war in Syria, Yemen and Libya that we all know about. There is, of course, the threat from Iran as well, which is driving spending among many countries in the region, um, and that includes in the land domain. And, you know, even, even now there's been recent news, uh, if we look at uh, Morocco and the uh, Western Sahara region, uh, tensions seem to be brewing there as well. So there's, again, many flashpoints that suggest that countries are still going to be spending lots of money on their armed forces, and, of course, that means more armoured vehicles in the next 10 years. Yeah, I mean, you raise an excellent point there with regards to the, the the variety of conflicts in and across the region. I mean, platform attrition will certainly be a factor in the procurement of future replacements, of course. I mean, Saudi Arabia has lost, I think, dozens of armoured vehicles in, in its uh, campaign in Yemen. Can I ask, though, the region that we're talking about, you know, has countries with coastlines from the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, the Red Sea, through to the Arabian Sea, and into the twin gulfs of Oman and Persia. These are vastly different military requirements, budgets, and politics. How does this sort of patchwork landscape affect the type of vehicles being procured? Yeah, as you say, there's many um, different requirements. And I think that means when you look at the market from a uh, broad um, broad overview sense that um, pretty much all of the areas of armoured vehicles from the, you know, the light 4x4 four four tactical vehicles to the um, heavier 6x6 six six and 8x8s, eight right up to the uh, main battle tanks, IFEs and APCs, they all look like they are going to receive a lot of investment. So I think for, for some countries, um, particularly with uh, internal security, the 4x4 four four market in particular will be will see a lot of investment because countries are going to be setting up patrols perhaps in, in disputed regions. So you might think Egypt and in the Sinai, places like that, they will need... Uh, these four by four uh, armored vehicles to provide protected mobility for their for their soldiers and patrols, but also for countries with a uh, potential regional disputes or um, threats from their borders, they are going to be looking much more closely. I think at the the heavier side of things as well, and uh, I think it's interesting. One of the the things I often talked about on this podcast um, in relation to other markets is that some countries are diverting some of the spending that perhaps would have gone um, towards large fleets of tracked vehicles in the past towards procuring the 6x6 and 8x8 armoured vehicles because those have better strategic and operational mobility. So they're they're much easier to deploy across longer distances if you need to uh, quickly be in another continent on the battlefield and able to make a difference. Those are much more appropriate in that sense. But for, I think, the countries in the Middle East, because many of the threats are so immediate, they are more willing, like like perhaps countries in, in Eastern Europe as well, to have much larger fleets of main battle tanks and APCs because those um, concerns about deploying them 
are are not so um, pressing. They don't they don't limit um, they don't have so many limitations in that sense. So I think we will see um, quite a big spend on on main battle tanks and APCs over the next ten years. I think particularly in in that area, there's a lot um, there's a lot of a uh, need for replacement or or upgrades. So. We'll we'll get into indigenous uh, capability in a in a second. But as I outlined earlier, I mean platforms are being sourced from suppliers around the world. Give us a few examples. And is the is the the, the range of suppliers increasing or decreasing? So I, I think it's um it's actually increasing in many ways. I think if you look at kind of Middle East and North African procurement in the past, um, it's traditionally been allies of the US where they're there buying American equipment predominantly, um, but also many European suppliers. Um, and of course, we have the Soviet Union as well that was linked very closely to some countries. So you have lots of um, legacy Soviet platforms still in service. But I think um, going forwards and looking at the sort of trends in some of the more recent procurements, it seems like some of these traditional players are starting to be um, disrupted by by new uh, exporters. So this includes uh, countries like Turkey and possibly also in the future will include South Korea as well. Because I think uh, if you look at, you know, countries like Oman, um, Bahrain, they've procured Turkish wheeled vehicles. Qatar is procuring um, many Turkish 4x4 vehicles as well because it's, um, I think it has a, a control in or, a, or a stake at least in one of the Turkish companies, BMC. So it's procuring many vehicles from them. I think South Korea, um, it's been very aggressively marketing its uh, K2 main battle tank, not just in the Middle East and North Africa region, but elsewhere too. But we have... Um, Good reason, I think, to believe that that will be offered for an Omani requirement, probably to replace the Challenger 2. And that's really a sign of thing to come, isn't it? Because, of course, um, the Challenger 2, Britain doesn't have a, a, a tank manufacturing industry anymore. So, of course, these countries are, are looking elsewhere. And I think there's potential for those new suppliers to step in the breach. One thing I've also found very interesting looking at where, where countries are procuring from is that Russia seems to perhaps be selling its wares not just to its traditional partners. So you would expect a country, say, like Algeria to be procuring lots of Russian equipment because that's in line with what they've been doing. But there are indications, you know, that um, Saudi Arabia might procure more Russian equipment. Possibly Kuwait might have interest in Russian T-90 main battle tanks. And a very good example is Iraq, which um, had been operating American uh, M1A1 Abrams main battle tanks. And it seems that probably due to concerns about, or American concerns about those vehicles um, falling into the hands of uh, Iranian-sponsored militias that are, of course, part of the Iraqi um, armed forces now, or state in in many ways. Iraq Iraq has moved towards uh, procuring the T-90 or uh, in replacement of the the M1, so one of its um, armored divisions, one of the one of the brigades of that armored division, has actually replaced um, the M1 Abrams with the T90 instead. So, it seems that Russia is perhaps uh, starting to have more of an influence among some uh, some countries where traditionally America was uh, the big player. So, um, possibly we'll see new suppliers start to benefit now from the market more than the uh, traditional incumbents. I want to ask actually about human rights. I mean, it, it's been a, it's been a topic of some debate. Let's say there's been there's been some significant upset in in Western countries in how equipment might be used in, for example, let's say Yemen. Do you think that human rights concerns or constraints as to how a country can use its equipment might impact where it chooses where where, where said country chooses to source its equipment from? might a country with less um, adherence to uh, the strict notion and ideals of human rights, like China, might a country like that look to benefit from uh, Western concerns? Yeah, I think given, um, as I say, the trends I've already noticed towards um, procurement from non-traditional suppliers, I think the human rights issue certainly has the potential to accelerate that trend because if we look at some of the big contracts recently in the region. One one that stands out is Saudi Arabia's procurement of the LAV 700 from um, General Dynamics Land Systems Canada. And this is this contract has been beset by many troubles and, and those really stem from human rights issues. So you have the uh, murder of Jamal uh, Khashoggi and you also had um, some disputes of the Canadian government uh, criticising the Saudi Arabians for detaining human rights activists as well around 2018. And 
reading the uh, reports on this, it seems that the Saudi Arabians were delaying payments to General Dynamics Land Systems Canada, which had such a, a big impact on the um, GDLS production line that the Canadian government seems to have actually accelerated its plans to procure new vehicles to try and keep them afloat, basically. Now, the, the deal has been restructured, and it seems that it's now going ahead again, but it shows that there are potentially big difficulties um, that both um, Western countries will face, or Western industry will face uh, selling to these countries. And then, of course, it must be very frustrating for a country like Saudi Arabia or the UAE, which has also or had a, had a freeze imposed on um, its importation of USM wraps, again, for um, concerns that they were transferring them to uh, proxies in the Yemen conflict. So it must be very frustrating for countries like that, um, that they can't simply procure the equipment as and when they want and must be held to certain conditions as to how, how they use it. So with more and better equipment on offer from China and other countries such as Turkey, particularly where these... Uh, stipulations as to how, how the equipment can be used and also the pressure to um, conform to the ideals of, of human rights, that these won't be so strong. And so perhaps we could see that they, those will become much more attractive suppliers for Middle Eastern and North African countries going forwards. Yep. Uh, back to uh, indigenous capability, which also might actually potentially solve a dilemma for countries who don't really want to have to um, answer as to how or where their platforms are being used. What about uh, the uh, MENA industries? Are, are they able to produce any kind of armoured vehicles? Yeah, I think they're making uh, great strides towards that area. And um, the, I think the thing that we have to note is that, it, of course, it, again, it varies uh, across the region, really. So two countries in particular, I think Israel and, and Turkey, um, of course, have very well advanced industries. They can offer, um, particularly in the armoured vehicle side, really the, the whole range of products from the 4x4s up to the main battle tanks, other countries, um, so I'm thinking here more Egypt, Algeria, they can license produce designs. So Egypt um, recently finished license producing the M1 A1 Abrams. Algeria is um, producing several vehicles under license. It's actually producing a, uh, the Nima 4x4 from the UAE. It's producing the uh, Fuchs uh, 2 from Germany. Um, seems to also perhaps be assembling some Russian equipment as well. You have the UAE, which, uh, again, also can uh, license produce some equipment and also has its own domestic manufacturers now. So NIMA, I've already mentioned, they have even exported out, outside of the MENA region. So that's been one of the success stories. And they are also collaborating with a uh, Turkish company, Otakar, to license produce a version of the Armour 8x8 for their armed forces. Um, and I think many countries that can are looking to to go the way of the UAE. So we know Saudi Arabia as well with its Vision 2030 policy to diversify its economy away from oil. It wants to procure more from its um, domestic defence industry. So I think the target is to have 50% of its military equipment needs met by Saudi Arabian industry by 2030. I think we're seeing probably most of the success at the moment and the, the first steps are coming towards the light side, the you know the lighter wheeled armored vehicles. So again, companies like Nimmer or even companies that use basic commercial off, uh, off the shelf chassis like uh, the Tour Land Cruiser, the Ford F five fifty, that sort of thing, and then they can put an armored body on them. That's a good first step. And I think, yeah, the the, the reasons for, for doing this, of course, are not only building up your own industry and becoming self sufficient in some ways, but also it's helping to kind of standardize the the equipment and uh, it means that you're not operating that kind of hodgepodge of different imported platforms from all over the world they can have a bit more of a joined up uh, procurement strategy they can integrate their own subsystems much more effectively into into the platforms and so i think that makes for a uh, much more capable military force all around so there's definitely a strong push in that re in in that direction um, and i think yeah the, the the question will be, how successful will it be? Well, that was actually my next question. That's nicely anticipated there, Sonny. <laughs> how successful can this be? Do you think we can see more countries in the MENA region slowly developing from the ground up their own manufacturing capability, as you say, going from four-wheel drives into maybe uh, to armoured vehicles and beyond? Yeah, I think there's there's definitely um, potential for, for good progress in this area. Um, the UAE, as I said, is, a, is really a, a standout example 
I think perhaps some of some of the big targets like that Saudi Arabian target I mentioned earlier, they do seem particularly ambitious, at least if you just look at the, the land side, because even the most uh, advanced industry, say, say Turkey, Turkey struggles, or is struggling to progress its Alte main battle tank program because it's dependent at the moment on foreign supplies for the power pack, which is a very specialised component that lots of countries struggle to develop. And of course, this will then mean that it's perhaps more difficult for them to export the, the platform to certain countries. And I know we've seen that in the air domain with the uh, T-129 helicopter exports held up by American engines that they use. So there's a potential for the same thing to happen there. And as I say, if if um, much of the spend in the land domain is going to be on main battle tanks, APCs, there are really few signs at the moment that many local industries are up to at least uh, the kind of design and um, side of this. Uh, perhaps licensed production is, is the good intermediate step, but but even then, looking at the, the contracts at the moment, I, I mean, I mentioned the, the Saudi LAV 700. There are several, you know, foreign military sales cases for the Abrams, those don't involve any licensed production. So it doesn't actually seem to have made the step quite yet. And of course, um, we're already getting closer to, to 2013. It's not a long time away in, in defence procurement terms. So I'm, I'm, I'm sceptical that, that some of them will be able to uh, quite realise their ambitions, perhaps in the way they would like to. But I do certainly think that for industry going forwards, they will need to be prepared to transfer technology to collaborate, set up joint venture companies. And I think that will is definitely a trend that's that's there to stay. Good stuff. Fascinating insight there. Uh, thanks again to Sonny Butterworth, Senior Land Analyst at Defence Insight. Sonny, are we going to have you on before the end of the year, do we think? I haven't got anything booked in, I don't think, Richard. So uh, this this could well be the last one. I, I suppose we'll, we'll have to see, yeah. <laughs> oh, this is it. Oh, that's a shame. OK, well, if I don't catch you before... Have a great Christmas and see you in 2021. Thanks again. Thanks very much. We are falling further and further behind. Word documents are not far from handwritten letters passed in the Civil War. Now the challenge is, well, how do you do that if you don't have your centralized command control, if your logistics are contested, if your communications are being jammed? Adversaries have figured out our game plan and are engineering asymmetric ways to interfere with that whole system. In the chaos of combat, warfighters need fast, secure communications and instant access to information. However, the digital information age we know today has changed the nature of warfare across all domains. Military commanders are acutely aware that new networks, systems and technologies are needed to ensure timely and effective communications. This is Shepherd Studios' podcast series on Five Eyes Connectivity, sponsored by our partner Viasat. In Series 1, we looked at connectivity issues facing the Five Eyes grouping of countries. For this second series, we're diving further into these issues, speaking to senior military leaders about the work underway to ensure military communication networks can withstand the expected threats of tomorrow. In this opening episode, we look at the connectivity issues facing the US military and its further development of the multi-domain operations concept. Many of the technological and operational advances that will be demanded in the JDO battlefield are aspirational, and there's a chasm between today's reality and long-term goals. How can the US and its allies make this transition? To learn more about Shepherd Studios' podcast series on Five Eyes Connectivity, a link will be provided in the show notes. Until next time. Hello, my name is Trevor Nash, and I'm the editor of Military Training here at Shepherd Media. We are now going to talk to Dan Gelston, the president of CAE's defence and security business, about how the company sees the future and what steps are being taken to develop future business. Uh, Firstly, Dan, thank you very much for speaking to us. And I'd like to ask you generally about the COVID pandemic and how it's impacting our industry. Yeah, it's certainly a great question. Uh, I'm not on, I, uh, omnipotent or omniscient, so uh, I, I take uh, my prognostication for what it's worth, which is probably very little. Um, I, I think let's start with the training aspect. 
um, I do believe that is going to accelerate a trend that the defense market was moving uh, towards regardless, but but certainly pulling it forward. Uh, the push towards training to the trainee versus trainee necessarily coming to the training, the push for virtual digitized environments uh, to certainly allow that to happen as well as uh, save on dollars, time, coordination, things to that effect. So, so an example would be trainees coming to different uh, training locations and having to be quarantined. So maybe they're sitting in their office, excuse me, sitting in their, in their hotel room for two weeks before they can do anything. All of a sudden, the push and something we've been doing at some of our sites like Dothan for years now, but now, particularly our military sites, there's a huge push to provide them, you know, linked iPads with all their all their course preparation material, their flight pass, a lot of their early testing, get them prepped so that 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 idle time isn't idle. Yeah, something yeah. we are moving towards anyway. But now there's this added COVID impetus with things like uh, the uh, you know the, the quarantine. There's also challenges for in-country. If you can't get into country, uh, a lot of our customers, particularly in, uh, in, in areas of the world that uh, have, have limited infrastructure, get the training to the people in the country. They're not necessarily allowed to come out. I'd also look at the budgetary impact. There's no doubt we're going to have to pay this COVID bill probably sooner rather than later. Nobody wants to talk about that right now, um, but the reality is it's going to have to be paid. And let's face it, certainly in the U.S., particularly in partner countries as well, usually the largest part of your discretionary budget is your defense budget. So that's going to have to take a hit somehow, some way. So yeah. instead of spending a lot of dollars on physical training, which you'll always have to have, particularly in a multi-domain environment where you've got space assets, air assets, ground, sea, all coming together, it takes a lot of time to coordinate. It's a lot of humans all together uh, challenged in a pandemic, and it's certainly expensive. So again, something that we were already looking at moving to supplement in the synthetic environment is now accelerated because you don't have the budgets to do some massive multi-domain operation practice run every six months or in between a national training center rotation. You're going to have to do it virtually. Uh, yeah. So in order to get the, the timing as well as the cost in a manageable schedule, I think actually for the training realm, you really are uh, accelerating that, that trend towards uh, a significant portion being in the augmented synthetic digital realm, if you will. Yeah, well, you know, obviously COVID is going to change the way that we all do business now. You know, putting your CA hat on now, what impact is it, specific impact has it had on the company? And how are you going to try to readdress the balance? I think, you know, we all know that we can't go and do shows at the moment. We can't send our sales business development guys out to meet customers. How are you going to get around that? Is it more Teams meetings, Zoom meetings? <laughs> yeah, certainly that's a part of it. Uh, I'm an extrovert myself, so I, I have to admit, <laughs> personally, this stuff drives me nuts. But then I then I think that we're blessed because if this had happened, I don't know, 20 years ago and I was trying to do yeah. it on a rotary phone, you know, I, I need to I need to count my blessings because this certainly is, is much better than that, although there's there's no replacement for that uh, nonverbal interaction uh, of face-to-face. -face. But as I said, I, I think it accelerates something that I'm very proud and, and happy to leverage because I didn't have much to do with it, the, the move towards that digital immersion that CAE has been investing in for a few years now. In fact, they had about a billion-dollar Canadian announcement a few years ago of focusing on their research and development for that digital immersion. And you see products like Rise and, and our Trax Academy, things to that effect that were already in place. And now we see a lot more demand for it, uh, particularly because that is more portable of a training solution. So maybe it's uh, VR goggles, it's hand tensors, you know, potentially it's an augmented reality with a limited physical cockpit or tank around you, but it, it's something that we can transport, we can ship into country or onto locations quite a bit easier than necessarily bringing people into a massive training center with huge 
full up simulators on, you know, 18, 20 tons sitting on, you know, hydraulic uh, stilts. I think there's always going to be a need for that. But uh, again, accelerating a trend that thankfully Mark Perrant and the team had recognized a few years ago and really gotten us out in front in my mind, part of the reason I, I was attracted to take the job at CAE, um, you know, a few years of really focused investment. And I think uh, I've got, I, I, I know I've got a very aggressive growth plan uh, between now and 2025. So I've got that organic capability to rely on, and then I'm going to uh, augment it with with potential inorganic mergers and acquisitions. And not surprisingly, it's probably going to be in the in the virtual simulation, digital immersion, cyber environment um, as as we look to really move from a platform centric training model to one that is truly indicative of multi domain operations. That's yeah. how our customers are fighting going forward. That's yeah. how they need to train. We need to lead that market space. It's interesting, Dan. You, you were talking earlier about acquisitions, mergers, teaming, very important. Um, but if you look at that in terms of what's how I view CAE at the moment, defense security, you've got a great balance between um, providing services, products, and then globally in CAE, you've got the military and civil side. When you're looking at mergers, acquisitions, and teaming, when you're talking about that, are you just talking about the defense and security side? How, how do you tie that in with the overall, or maybe Mark Ferrand, how does he tie that in with the overall company strategy? Yeah, absolutely. As I said, the areas where I'm specifically interested, if you, again, if you think moving from just platforms will always be a piece of it, but to true multi-domain operations, having every tier, we're very strong in the air tier. We've got great capability in, in land and sea, but you need to add cyber, you need to add space, and I'd love to be as strong in sea and land as, as we are in the air tier. There, there's areas that, that you know, certainly I don't have forever to build those organically. So when I look at cyber, particularly the networking, the glue that's going to connect the next generation of multi-domain operations, training, and exercises – I see a need to augment our capability there and certainly hit fast forward on some of our synthetic environment, our digital immersion. There's some companies doing great work there. So as I look with a primary focus uh, for DNS, those capabilities carry over and have synergies to healthcare and commercial quite nicely. They also are going to need further networking capability. They're also going to need cyber. I mean, in this day and age, particularly cyber defense and cyber training you know, is, a, is a mandatory. Uh, we can't be secure in, in, in any of our training scenarios. So, well, certainly the primacy of effort is for DNS and these potentially very large acquisitions that we're, that we're looking at. Uh, transformative acquisitions. I, I certainly see synergies with commercial and healthcare. And actually, surprisingly, healthcare, I'm seeing a, a lot of uh, opportunity, again, as we kind of described, with the COVID challenge or places in theater needing that virtual training capability because they can't get their people out or we don't want to send live humans into uh, an area that's uh, restricted or maybe still a war zone. You know, being able to provide them, uh, you know, ship them human patient simulators, ship them uh, virtual reality capability uh, that's much easier to get into country, and then remote learning, being there with them virtually as they do anything from uh, M1, A1, you know, tank engine maintenance to prop maintenance in the virtual world. And you can sit there and, you know, the the, the next bolt that you need to unscrew to do this uh, dash 10 maintenance gets highlighted for you and they use their tensors to remove it to, you know, apply that to uh, healthcare, doing the same thing with a virtual human body or a human body cadaver robot uh, and walking through with them in a secure environment that's heavily networked uh, to have a trainer along with them in the virtual reality or augmented reality as they train for, for surgery. So I see a lot of synergy there with healthcare and giving Heidi, our new president of healthcare, entree into the defense realm, um, where you know a basic level of, of of healthcare triage training happens across the forces. So I really see a lot of growth there between particularly uh, defense and healthcare, which we, we maybe haven't taken as great advantage of uh, up to this point. Stay on this topic of um, acquisitions and whatever. You know, famously, you guys bought AOCE, formed MSI out of it. 
that seems to have been going quite well. Can you exploit that still further? Is there still business there to be had? Yeah, absolutely. So what that allowed us to do is fundamentally tap into the, the top secret SCI and SAP world, uh, particularly in the United States. Again, it's foci mitigated. Uh, they're under a proxy. Uh, so another another level above SSA. Um, but that gave us entree and, and gave us great programs like KDAM uh, at Kirkland Air Force Base. They're doing a lot of Air Force Special Forces training, which not surprisingly, you know, there's there's uh, clearance requirements there. So I want to capitalize on what was a, a, a very timely acquisition, uh, but we certainly need to add mass there. And I would point you in the direction of the budgets, particularly in the United States, with the pivot towards peer v peer, with the the concerns, particularly around cyber intrusion from some of our our, our potential uh, crypt adversaries, you know your China's, Russia's, Iran's, North Korea's, um, you'll see a massive shift for all these next generation platforms moving into the classified realm. In fact, I just last week did an analysis of the Air Force budget. So of their available acquisition dollars, 46% of them, United States Air Force, 46% of their dollars now sit in a classified bucket. So almost half of your addressable market is classified. If you don't have access to yeah. that secret, top secret SCI and SAP world, yeah, you're, you're going to be a non-player, particularly when these next generation platforms come online. So we've got to have that access, and, and AOC was the first step to giving us that entree. And the great news is because we have that access now, we're a viable acquirer of businesses that are already sitting in that realm. So if we wanted to go get a TSSCI company and didn't have the proxy, didn't have that current work, we probably would be less competitive in what I'm sure is going to be a you know, potential you know, bidding war against a couple of companies to acquire them. Because you know, if, if a foreign parent doesn't have the ability to do work at that TSSCI SAP level, you know, it's not going to be very attractive for, for synergies. In fact, it would just bring you backwards. So we've got that capability. I need more of it. I need more access, particularly cyber and network and and uh, you know C4, C5, ISR, um, and uh, AOCE was exactly what we needed to, to get us. It was a great start, but we need to uh, we need to add some combat multipliers for them, if you will, uh, give them a give them a good amount more capability. And so, not surprisingly, you know, some of the targets we're looking at M and A wise ha have quite a bit of classified personnel, classified work. Um, but we're in a position where we can we can take them on just the same as a U.S. parent could take them on. You know, we can do TSSCI work with without a problem with our current foci mitigation uh, structure. And by the way, the SSA team uh, won a Cogswell Award last year. So if you're not familiar, that's that's the top six, if I remember, top six percent of all foci mitigated, all classified programs in the SSA realm uh, in the United States. So they're doing a fantastic job uh, working inside that foci mitigation, foreign ownership control or influence. Um, so in that realm, doing very well, not just that adds to the confidence that, uh, hey, we know what we're doing. In the U.S., yeah. when it comes to TSSCI, you know we can buy you, we can leverage you, uh, find great synergies. There's no there, there's no issues to worry about on that front. Yeah, you know we, we've talked about technology, Dan, and um, we are sort of hitting this inflection point at the moment when new technology is coming on board. Classic example: CA Tracks Academy. What the U.S. Air Force is doing with pilot training next. Yeah. Um, it's you, you've got IR and D projects going on. How on earth do you control all this, you know, these brainwaves coming from people saying, yeah, we've got this great idea. Yeah, well, it's maybe not a good idea. How do you <laughs> corral all that? Yeah, it is. Uh, it's interesting. And of course, with a truly global business, I'll use your, your, your familiar, particularly, I'm sure, with the single synthetic environment in the UK. So we have a similar initiative that both we've been investing from IRAD and, if you will, CRAD with winning programs down in Orlando with DIU, you know, working on Air Force Next. It's all kind of circling around a very similar theme. What I think is interesting is in the UK, they're a little behind on contract vehicles and contract dollars 
but their vision is greater for the single synthetic environment. They see it not only as a train defense training tool, but as something particular, if you follow Sir Richard Barron, that encompasses preparedness for an entire country, whether it's whether it's uh, a, a digital environment, a digital twin that would prepare you for pandemic or natural disaster or economic uh, downturn, as well as defense related or putting some combination of those all together to prepare the nation's leaders, not just in the DOD defense world, MOD defense world, uh, but in political positions, in, in healthcare positions to be ready for that. So I'm really impressed with what I think is an accurate vision of the future. Again, Sir Richard Barron is, uh, it, it, you know, can, can, can do a much, much more eloquent job of I in laying that future out for you. But then you match that with what's happening in the U.S. The U.S. maybe doesn't quite have the scope yet, but particularly with STE, the synthetic training environment, and what we're doing on pursuits like global situational awareness for SOCOM, uh, U.S. Special Operations Command, um, you've got a more robust infrastructure around it. So the dollars are there. They've actually been accelerated in the budget. The contract vehicles are in place and they're moving forward. So I want to match the broader vision of SSC in the UK with the advanced funding and contracts and really take our IRAD and our CRAD, if you will, and marry those together. I think we could we could really be powerful. And we're about to hopefully hear good news in the next maybe week or two on so SOCOM Global Situational Awareness, um, which again is, is kind of creating a single ecosystem for multi-domain operations for SOCOM. So, you know, space, air, ground, sea, cyber, all coming through in a single a COP, a single common operating picture for those decision makers back in an operation center. And then both UK and the Americans are looking to insert eventually AI into this solution. Um, would you say then, in a bizarre way, that COVID, this current environment, has given you an opportunity to look at the possibility for mergers, acquisitions, and teamings to take technology forward? So is there a benefit to COVID, if you will. Yeah, I see an aspect of that. I mean, we want to be aggressive. Uh, we, we don't just want to weather the storm. We want to come out of the storm stronger. So if we're aggressive, smart, but aggressive through this process, we can take advantage of that and maybe bring in some of these properties that might have not been available otherwise. So, you know, it's a hand in hand momentum. Uh, you know, it just, it just builds the momentum. So I really think Mark Perrant's got a vision uh, to bring CAE as a whole out of this much stronger. Uh, I was very interested in you talking about the single synthetic environment. Is there any sort of link there with the work you're doing with L3 Harris on um, SCARS for the US Air Force? Is there any crossover? Yeah, yeah so that, uh, that's certainly an excellent win. And obviously, I came from L3 Harris, now not uh, Lenny's training business. Um, you know the the legacy link guys. Uh, they were they're in a sister segment to me when I was doing the, the the communications. But subcontractor to them, fantastic win. I, I think you're all in the same environment. Um, it, you, you do kind of cross over into some some classified pieces there. But I think it's safe to say that uh, what we're doing in the UK, what we're doing with SOCOM, what we're doing in Orlando, what we're doing with labs and uh, in partnership on SCARS with uh, L3 Harris, who probably has a bit more lab work than we've had in the United States classically, you're, you're honing in on some real capability. And I think the key going forward, particularly as we look more at software base versus hardware solutions, is that you've got to have an open source architecture. And that's how it's really going to proliferate throughout the market, become a combat multiplier again, to overuse my army terms, uh, yeah. and, and just just literally take you know, world domination. By the way, Dan, I love the term combat multiplier because <laughs> it was fashionable when I was serving. It then went out of fashion. It's coming back again now. Uh, and yeah. it just sum, sums it up in two words. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Plus, it brings a little warm spot in my heart. You know, just to remember the good old days when I did cool things in my life instead of spreadsheets and uh, you know all that stuff. And I've got a final question for you. Um, you've talked about some of the programs that you're working on at the moment. Can you give me an idea of? And it's difficult at the moment. I appreciate because 
budgets are all over the place. But what are the programs you're looking at around the world that you really got an eye on and you think you could bring something to, you know, benefit the customer? Yeah, well, certainly um, some exciting things in our core and adjacent spaces. So as I think in the U.S., um, you've got uh, the STE, synthetic training environment, and we're, we're, we're in pieces of that, but there's, there's some pretty big opportunities, uh, particularly with VT Max stepping out. You know, coal engineering has done very well in, in, that, in that realm uh, under the, the bylight. Um, but RCVT, the big $900 plus million dollar contract for the reconfigurable virtual trainers, there's going to be an air version and a ground version. So th- that's very attractive to me. Um, you're looking at uh, greater cyber capability. So, you know, we had looked hard at Cyber Trident, the, the big uh, U.S. military cyber training contract, you know, how, how there's, there's uh, capability that we can bring to that realm. It's a big future pieces, one kind of in our core and what the future of our core will be, one in a very complementary adjacent space. Of course, you've got the, you know, what the, what the next generation is happening in Air Force. You know, we're working very closely, particularly in the air tier with, with where the Navy is taking their training. And it's much more similar to a, what we've been doing for a few years at Dothan uh, for the Army fixed wing training. And then internationally, there's some really exciting opportunities. We're pursuing um, the Jet Training Center, NATO Jet Training Center in Greece, for instance. Certainly uh, not only a necessary uh, capability for Greece, but understanding the geopolitical environment, the tensions with Turkey right now, you know, the timing could be better for them to reemphasize the NATO connection. Certainly in Canada, there's a lot of exciting opportunity, Um, you know, big multi-billion dollar uh, procurements coming down the pike in our backyard. Fact would be one yeah. of the largest ones. Our Skyline uh, JV were, were the two incumbents on the yeah. current work. When it gets consolidated, multi-billion uh, dollar opportunity. You've got Future Fighter uh, coming to um, Canada, and we're we're teamed with a few of uh, there, there's three players there. You know, Saab, Vigan, uh, Boeing's F-18, and Lockheed Martin with the F-35. Um, so that's that's certainly a big, exciting opportunity for us. And then uh, looking hard at, at Asia Pacific, I think we're underweighted there. Um, we certainly have a great group based out of Australia working. But if you look at only about 5% of our revenues and about half of my revenue comes internationally, only about 5% of that from APAC. I, I think we can do better there. So we've actually teamed up with a company called the Asia Group. Uh, experts in Asia. And then leveraging in the Middle East, uh, we've got some great training centers, particularly in the UAE for naval training, for UAV training, rotary. I I think we're looking, we've brought a lot of uh, other friendly Middle Eastern countries. Uh, KSA, uh, Saudi Arabia has looked at those capabilities and and seems very interested in having something similar. So some real exciting growth opportunities, uh, to say the least. And then if you add a truly synergistic a major acquisition on top of that, you know, I, I, I'm very bullish on the future of CAE defense and security, probably a little bit biased, but uh, yeah, you'll but, forgive me for that one. But uh, yeah. I, I think we're in a great position to make the most of the COVID storm and the major shift in national defense strategies to this peer versus peer in a multi-domain environment. Dan, thank you very much for your time. That was brilliant. Great. Well, it's fantastic uh, to meet you, Trevor. I Hope to meet you in person uh, someday. And uh, yeah. after walk, uh, working with so many, uh, you know, British parent companies, it's always nice to to hear that accent again. I spent uh, plenty of time in in, in your country, and uh, look forward to getting back there as, as soon as I'm allowed to escape our borders. Good to meet you, Dan. Thank you very much indeed. You've been listening to another episode of the Weekly Defence Podcast. As always, a big thanks to everyone who took the time in being with us today. And for our listeners, if you enjoyed the show, make sure you like and subscribe, leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcast. Shepherd Media is also offering a 20% discount for annual subscription to Premium News. Head over to shepherdmedia.com forward slash subscribe and insert code podcast20 to redeem, which is valid until the 31st of December 2020. Until next week, thanks for listening. 